Hi there, welcome to episode 156 of the Waveback Music Podcast. My name is Chris. And I'm Matt. And we're here to listen to the most interesting video game music there is. We've got something a little different this month, and that's a special episode curated entirely by one of our listeners. It also happens to be a subject that, while we both greatly appreciate, it's one that we're not very well versed in at all. Gentlemen, start your PC engines, because today we bring you the TurboGrafx-16 Shooter Special. Well, hello, Matt. Hello, Chris. How are you this fine day? I'm good, actually. How's everything with you? Not bad, not bad. Kids are off school, just kind of, you know, hiding down here in the basement <laughs> while they're upstairs playing and stomping around. And, you know, the weather finally turned back into fall. We were yeah, we were rocking shorts. I was out there raking leaves in shorts, sweating my butt off the other day. It just seemed so, uh, nothing quite like doing fall yard work in summer weather, you know? I'm telling you, it's it's crazy. It is indeed. But uh, so we've got a we've got a, a thick show uh, ahead of us. So I think uh, I think we should pretty much get right to work here because uh, there's all for a, it. this is going to be pretty information heavy. Uh, this was a listener request from one Rob Metzger. He's been a listener for quite some time, and he asked us to do this way back in January, which honestly feels like a lifetime ago. Mm-hmm. But here we are, less than a year later, finally adhering to his uh, episode request. Rob chose the tracks and wrote up this history segment, and which we are going to dive into right now. In fact, Rob wrote uh, pretty much his, a history segment for just about every, not just about, every single track that we're going to listen to. <laughs> uh, I have adapted his stuff and did you know, some, some brief editing, uh, but, but this, this is Rob's script. We are, we are running his show today. And I'm uh, I'm excited because I know none of this music, absolutely none of it. Uh, I might know the Lords of Thunder track because I love that game, but uh, for the most part, I think I'm unfamiliar with just about everything here. But anyway, Matt, let's yes, hit sir. him with some history. You and me both, we're gonna do it. Let's hit him with the history over the head, <laughs> grabbing a big old thick Turbo Graphic 16 and cocking him over the head with some history. Sure. <laughs> There's nothing I love more than beating people down with history, so... <laughs> it's um, the best. I'm, I'm so ready. <laughs> All right. The TurboGrafx-16, known as the PC Engine outside of North America, was a 16-bit console designed by Hudson Soft and sold by NEC Ho Entertain... <laughs> Ho. <laughs> Ho. <laughs> All right. I'm not editing that out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. And w- <laughs> and was sold by NEC Ho Electronics. Uh, that's, that's, that's the highlight of the episode. <laughs> the console was very successful in Japan. However, in North America, it did not fare as well. The base unit used... I have no idea how you're supposed to say this. I'm I call go- them Hue cards. I'm going to go with Hue cards. H-U-C-A-R-D-S. Could be Hue cards, oh. but that sounds really silly. Yeah. Or turbo chips in North America. I like that better for yeah. their games. Uh, these were credit card sized cards that went into the front of the console. The PC engine and turbo graphics were region locked due to eight of the pins on the unit being reversed. Sneaky, sneaky. Clever. Mm. The controller was similar to an NES controller with a D pad, select, run, start, and two face buttons. They also added, quote-unquote, turbo switches above each button that had three selections. The higher selection on it, the more it would register multiple inputs for a one-button press. One problem with the system is that it only had one controller input on the front, so you had to use a turbo tap, or multi-tap for the PC engine, to connect more than one controller. This device would convert the one controller port into four ports. The other issue with the controllers was the TurboGrafx controllers had a different diameter than the PC Engine controllers, so you couldn't use the one controller on the other system and vice versa. Interestingly enough, when the Turbo Duo came out, Turbo Graphics with a CD attachment built in, they switched to the PC Engine controller diameter, making the TurboGrafx-16 the only console that could use the TG-16 excuse me, controllers without a conversion cable. There were many different consoles built with the PC Engine family, so we will go over the basics. First was the PC Engine slash TurboGrafx-16. These units could only play Hue card games. 
First, first add-on that came out was a CD-ROM attachment for the PC Engine and the TurboGrafx-16 called the CD-ROM 2. This allowed the unit to play newly made CD-ROM games. Eventually, they brought out the Turbo Duo and PC Engine Duo systems, which came with the Super CD-ROM 2 system built into it. The <laughs> Super CD-ROM 2 increased the buffer RAM from 64 kilobytes to 256 kilobytes. That's more kilobytes than you can shake a stick at. <coughs> <laughs> I have a lot of sticks. <laughs> if you had a system with an add-on CD on it, you could buy a Hue card to put into the system that would add the memory. Finally, they came out with the Arcade card. This was a card that increased the onboard RAM of the system to two megabytes. Whoa. If you had a Duo system, you could buy the Arcade card Duo. However, if you had the CD add-on, you had to buy the more expensive Arcade card to play the arcade games. Lastly, the Super Graphics came out, which was a which was back to Hue cards, but five exclusive games only ever came out for it. Today we will listen to a few Hue card games, some CD games, and one arcade card game. Matt, what is your personal history with the TurboGrafx-16 slash PC Engine slash Turbo Duo slash uh, Super Graphics? I really want to say none, just to make everything you said funnier. <laughs> um, but I actually had a, a childhood friend growing up... Um, who, uh, you know, convinced his parents to buy him a TurboGrafx-16. And um, I I don't even know that I physically played it. I think I just hung out with him while he played it. And I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. And then um, at some point, the handheld system came into my kind of uh, circle of friends. But again, never played it. But I always did like the idea that the hue cards could be played on the the portable but um at any rate I, I i do remember kind of thinking like oh this is a really like vibrant system the the colors and the you know and, and kind of the um designs and stuff were really i remember them being very uh beautiful and rich and, and thinking like oh it's a cool system but never thinking like i need to have this and that's it I have, um, I didn't have any friends, as far as I know. Uh, I don't remember having any friends that had a TurboGrafx-16 when I was a kid. I remember seeing it in Toys R Us, but I had zero experience with the actual system until way later in life. I got a TurboGrafx-16 probably when I was around 17 or 18, I think, uh, is when I finally got my own system. Maybe a bit before that. No, it was, it was probably around 16 or 17 uh, when I got my uh, console at a Philly Classic... Uh, trade show uh, convention in uh, obviously in Philly. Actually, it wasn't in Philly. It was outside of Philly. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> false advertising. I got a TurboGrafx-16. Um, I oh wait, that's yeah. I got it around that time. I got the TurboGrafx from the Philly Classic, but I got a Turbo Duo from um, somebody at uh, I was working at Funko Land, and they tried the trade in the system. We didn't take it, so they just gave it to me. Um, that never worked, though. Um, uh, funny story, I sent it in to, like, maybe a couple of months ago, I sent it into Stone Age Gamer to have them fix it for me, and they were like, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this system, you just don't have the right AC adapter. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I've been sitting on this thing for, what, the 20 years? <laughs> never That's actually so playing it, because I didn't have the right, uh, right power cord for it, like a dummy pants. So... Um, <laughs> I have a couple of games for the system. Actually, the most time I've spent with TurboGrafx-16 software was on the Wii, uh, because the uh, the Wii had TurboGrafx stuff as part of the Virtual Console mm -hmm. service. So I played, uh, was it Rondo of Blood there? I played Airzonk, uh, Lords of Thunder, the first two Bonk games, I think I, I played through the first one, I don't think I finished the second one. Mm -hmm. I never really tried Bonk 3. Um, I like shoot 'em ups they're super cool, um, but there's very few of them that I've stuck with long enough to really finish. Um, my all-time favorite is UN Squadron on Super Nintendo. Uh, yeah. I'm not great at them, but I do really enjoy them. Uh, so this is going to be a, a fun thing to listen to, a bunch of, bunch of music for games that I know about historically speaking, but I don't really have much uh, personal interaction with. So... Yeah, uh, let's let's get started here, Matt. Why don't you introduce our first track? Uh, certainly. 
Our first track comes to us from Blazing Lasers. It's a Hue card game, apparently. Blazing Lasers, known as Gunhead in Japan, I kind of like that name better, <laughs> is a vertical shooter released in 1989 in both North America and Japan. The game received critical praise for graphics capabilities, lack of slowdown, intense gameplay, and sound. Uh, this game was one of the first releases for the TurboGrafx-16 and is still considered one of the best games on the console. In the game, you take control of the Gunhead Advanced Star Fighter. What's that acronym? GAFS. <laughs> and fight through nine areas. <laughs> that, that didn't work. <laughs> nope, not at all. Um, yeah, right, you fight through nine areas. Okay. There are four weapons and four different support weapons the player can pick up. The game's music was composed by... Masamoto Miyamoto, Kenji Takeuchi, and Masana Masanobu uh, Sukamato. We will be listening to Area One Thunderblaze. Enjoy. <music> Thunderblaze from Blazing Lasers, aka Gunhead. Uh, Gunhead. That was pretty cool. Uh, I always forget what the Turbo Graphics natively sounded like because when the system was released, it was kind of like it wasn't quite Genesis, but it was definitely an improvement over NES. But it's got mm -hmm. it's got some really the sound is like kind of in between those two as well. You know, like it's not quite as abrasive as the Sega Genesis is very like. Sound, you know, but it's also still got some of those very uh, retro chip tuny sounds in it, like the NES was capable of. Um, but as for the song itself, it was quite nice. I, I rather enjoyed it. Yeah, I there was something about it that made me. It, it gave me like a, it filled me with feelings of like old Nintendo stuff. I think it's like the upbeat and kind of the very high endy like light and uplifting kind of music that um you know some older nintendo stuff has uh i really like the drum beat mm -hmm. it really like very driving for for something of that caliber um really well done actually i, I kind of i think i enjoy it a little more than i'm uh capable of explaining at the moment <laughs> but uh I, I really enjoy it though it definitely made me want to be a ship blowing up lots of other ships. It made me want to be a gunhead. Yes. Of course, what doesn't? <laughs> Not to be confused with Cuphead. I don't want to be a Cuphead. No, me neither. I don't have film, don't fill me with liquid. about the liquid inside of Cuphead's head. But. I was going to say, don't fill me with liquid. Fill me with bullets. <laughs> <laughs> now that needs to be on a t-shirt. All right. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, we're off to a pretty good start. Let's see. Next, the next song comes to us from Soldier Blade, which is a Hue card game, uh, which is a perfect example of just how expensive this system can get, as it currently Ooh. runs for about $263 loose. Soldier Blade is a vertical shooter released in 1992 in both North America and Japan. You control the titular starship and are tasked with completing the game's seven stages in order to wipe out the Zeograd army, an alien race bent on conquering Earth. This is the fourth game in the Star Soldier series. Um, sorry, I'm just getting sidetracked on the, the history of the Star Soldier series because I think 
if uh, if I'm remembering correctly, Star Soldier itself, while as a big series, it's kind of its own weird spin-off from uh, Star Force, which was a mm-hmm. Tecmo joint. But uh, I love Hudson Tecmo. got to do the home port of Star Force for NES, and then they took that and just kind of ran off with their own spin-off series, Star Soldier, that became... Uh, way more successful than Star Force ever was, which is uh, fun. Anyways, uh, there are three different <laughs> weapons that can be picked up by the player. The game was met with mixed reviews as it was rushed to get out before the duo systems came. Some considered it too easy, while others said it was a great game and one of the best on the console. The composer is Masaki Inoue. Uh, blanket apologies to all humans on the planet. We will be <laughs> listening to a track <laughs> called Operation One, and here it is. Enjoy. soldier blade and that was very invigorating i liked that one very much got to agree that was really good yeah it's it seems a little more uh synth heavy but uh Mm -hmm. it's it's got some very very uh early 90s vibes going on there but it's like boy if that doesn't say like here's how this is how you get started this is some level one energetic uh shooter music i i i thought it was really good i had really good uh Really good rhythm to it, really good cadence, really good uh, energy. I thought it was wonderful. I really like that um, that lead synth. There's a great kind of uh, reverb on it mm-hmm. that uh, really kind of made it stand out to the whole... You know, it really put it up front and center and then gave it like a full-on... Um, what's the word? A presence. It's really good. I agree. <laughs> I like presence. I do too, and with the holidays coming up. Yep, yep. A bunch of those in our future, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's a bunch of those in my kids' future. I don't know. What yeah, I'm yeah, right. I don't, I don't get nothing I anymore. think the number one thing on my wish list is a trencher. I want to. <clears throat> I want to. I want to be able to carve the the sidewalk out in my uh, in front of my house. You know, like I've been hitting it with the weed whacker, and it's it's just not enough. I need I need a trencher to get in there and just really clear that out. Mm. That's what I want for Christmas. You know how I know we're old? <laughs> <laughs> uh, lawn equipment. Uh, that was that was a great trek. Thank you, yeah. thank you for that one, Rob. <laughs> uh, so, all right, Matt, you're up next. What's what's yep. the next song? Yes, oh, sir. Air Sonk. I love this one. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Our next track comes to us from the game called Air Zonk. It's also a Hugh Cart. Another expensive game currently sitting around $137 loose. Uh, you know, that pocket change. <laughs> pocket change, Rob. What are you talking about? <laughs> Air Zonk, known in Japan as PC Genjin, is a horizontal scrolling shooter. It is an attempt to update the company's image via a modern punkish character called Zonk. Not to be confused with Bonk. 
<laughs> uh, when you <laughs> when you look at him, <laughs> I was enjoying listening to this happen in real time, I know. <laughs> knowing what the next sentence was before you did. Yeah, because I don't I don't read this in advance. <laughs> Why would I do that? When you look at him, he resembles the TurboGrafx 16 mascot, Bonk. <laughs> Wait a second. The game has a total of five levels and is lighthearted and humorous. At the start, you pick a companion character, such as an anthropomorphic gumball machine or, <laughs> or a mummy with a drill on its head. Is I $137, huh? All right. Before each level, the player can choose the limit of using the companion character or not to use them at all. There are also three difficulty levels. <laughs> Sweet, spicy, and bitter. This is amazing. Uh, Sonic has... Uh, Sonic. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Chris. I wasn't told I was going to be reading this much. I feel like um, I feel like Orson Welles. <laughs> Can peas. Ah, what the hell? All right. Um, Zonk has seven types of power-ups. But like every other shooter, if you pick up a power-up that you are not using... You lose the power-up you were, and you get the new one, a la Contra. The composers of Air Zonk are Desuke Morishima and Hisashi Matsuhita. Matsuhita. Matsushita. Matsushita, you're right. I missed that age. Matsushita. Hisashi Matsushita. We will be listening to Stage 1, the Aqua Bass, and I will be happy not to be reading as we are listening. Enjoy! Base from Air Zonk, and this is a game that I actually am uh, rather familiar with. I've never made it that far into it because I'm not great at these 
games, but uh, I, I, rem I remember this song, that, that weird little... I don't know what that is. It's supposed to be someone saying yeah in the background. I don't know what I don't know what exactly that weird digital sound is. But you mean the dog barking? That is the dog barking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean that to be disrespectful, but that's immediately what I thought of. <laughs> I never thought of it that way, but you're right, it sounds like a dog barking. I love it. It sounds like the bark from that Simpsons episode with McGruff the crime dog. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> Brought to you by... That dog can sell anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this was such a great track. This is such a great pick. Um, this was... I remember when this came out. I remember seeing TV commercials for it and thinking, like, that was the first time I ever really wanted a TurboGrafx-16 myself. Uh, when I saw Airzonk, I was like, what a cool character, this robot with a big old lightning bolt and sunglasses. It's like, he was, he was super cool. Uh, and I remember seeing commercials for it and thinking like, I'd, I'd get a TurboGrafx-16. I'd like to play this game. This guy looks super cool. Uh, of course, I never, you know, I didn't get one because there were there were other Nintendo games for me to ask for for Christmas instead, yeah. but uh, still, uh, I always thought this was a cool game, and I, like I said, I really put time into it when it came out on Wii, uh, where I played a, a bunch of it, and I, I, I really enjoy it. I think it's a really good shooter, and this song in particular uh, has a really good, really good vibe to it. It's a, uh, I'm trying to picture exactly what this stage looks like. I, get, I'm, I feel like it's flying over a city, but I, I might be mistaken. Uh, it's been a long time since I played this, but uh, it does match the uh, it does match the frantic action of this game quite well, and it's a it's a good example of some some more killer first stage music. I liked it. This, if this is a first, uh, yeah, this is a first stage. What am I saying? I mean, I wow, that's a lot of high energy, like right out of the gate, and I dig it. You know, we we bagged on it's kind of like, you know, barking dog thing. But, you know, after like 10 seconds, I didn't even notice it anymore. And it kind of just said, you know, it's, it's when you first hear something new in a song. You're like, what? Um, and this definitely was that. Huh? Um, but uh, it, it it fell in and, and the rest of the track just kind of kept it moving. And, but like in the best possible way, like that's mm. really good. I, I'm very very unfamiliar with, with turbo graphics and its its offerings. I think I know like Splatterhouse, Bonk, and was Space Harrier on this or am I Yeah, I think there's a Space Harrier port on this. Yeah, I might know that one. That's about it. So these are all like really new to me. Hmm. Well, uh I think I think this is going I think it's going pretty well so far. I'm enjoying <laughs> it. Let's I mean yeah, I'm it. I'm always I and I everywhere I go I enjoy myself. <laughs> Until the cops are called. <laughs> Next up, we have a song from Nexer, which is a CD game. Nexer is a vertical scrolling shooter released only in Japan for the PC Engine Super CD-ROM. I don't know why I'm saying it like that. It's fun. However, since this is a Super CD-ROM game, you can play on the turbo on a tur Turbo Duo, as CD games are not region locked. Hooray! The shooter was released late in the PC Engine's life and sadly gets passed over by many who do not know the system, like me. It has been described yeah. as one of the better shooters on the system, but if you want to play it, you are better off emulating as the loose price for this game is currently going for a whopping 280 bucks. Jeez. There are seven stages in the game and three difficulty levels, normal, hard, and... Hidiz, which means so cruel. When you play the game, you will notice that it is a beautiful space shooter, with the first level starting in a war zone with giant battleships warping on screen. The weaponry is restrained as there are two weapons attached to your ship, a standard weapon and sub-weapon, and there are no bombs in the game. You can get a shield, but it will only protect you from a single hit. If you get hit, you will go back to the last checkpoint. There are no continues from where you got hit in the game. We will be listening to Stage 1 music. Rob says, I hope you like it because you will hear this a ton. This game is very difficult. So, here we go. Stage 1 from Nexer. Enjoy.
Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well then, <laughs> that game that 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 song had a conclusion. So, it so, uh, certainly did. My my heart is racing, and uh, that's not just because the music was exciting. But uh, my my kids are home from school today. I'm usually recording this when either they're in bed or they're not here. Uh, and since I have headphones on, I didn't hear my daughter sneak down to the basement and stand right next to me and scare the ever-loving crap out of me <laughs> in the middle of listening to this track because she wanted to grab something out of the basement, some, like, dry erase, dry erase board eraser. Uh, so that was fun. Uh, no, this was, this was awesome. Uh, of course, that, that leap to CD quality, you know what I mean? That, yeah. um... It, and this is so emblematic of uh, CD video game music from this time period. You know, when when PC CDs were just you know getting to be a thing. Like this very high quality synthesizer uh, sound is mm-hmm. is so very. Uh, it, it's so I have such a nostalgia for that very specific time uh, in video game history when CD ROMs just they were the future you know and it's one of the reasons i i i like the philip cdi so much because like yeah a lot of that stuff turned out to be complete garbage but there was this uh this sheen uh that it was all wrapped up in you know there's loading times and and things aren't never quite exactly what you expect them to be but on the same token the sound quality was always like leagues above what was coming before it so while, while all the other stuff was kind of weird this uh, CD quality sound was the the one part of it that was like a hundred percent lived up to its uh, to its promise of the time. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I think of stuff like even when you think of those like terrible Zelda CDI games, the sound quality on them is amazing. Uh, you know, when we first got our first PC in our house with a CD-ROM. It came with a copy of the uh, Secret of Monkey Island, which you know hey. didn't look a whole lot different from versions on ms dos and whatnot but boy the sound quality was just mm-hmm. wow you know and I, I think of like early sega cd games of like wow this game sewer shark not a really yeah. good game these no. fmv sequences are kind of grainy looking and when i say kindy kind of i mean like the beach Ooh. but uh <laughs> <laughs> but the sound quality you could hear them talking yeah. and it was a. Uh, that kind of stuff was amazing, but that, that's kind of what this song is reminding me of. But also, just sound quality aside, it was a really energizing. Again, great stage one kind of music. Uh, I liked it. I liked it quite a bit. Um, I mean, you've pretty much kind of hit the nail on the head here. There isn't much I can add to what you've said. I, uh, I'll talk about composition, I guess. Then it's yeah, really I was really more focusing on uh, sound quality. So by all means, no, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, but I mean. The first thing I was going to talk about is just how much clarity there is and, like, you know, how, how beautiful it is um, sonically. Um, as far as, you know, composition is concerned, like, this is... I, I was watching a little bit of um, gameplay, and it was the first level, and I was like, uh, yeah, I can totally see this being, like, first level music. The ship's warping in, like, really, really cool kind of stuff happening. Um but it's, you know, one of those, it's like a bullet hell game, sort of. It's like the, the great, great, great granddaddy of the bullet hell, hell stuff. Um, so, oh, excuse me. So, you know, to to hear the track, it, it, it makes kind of this uh, perfect sense to me. Um, fantastic, like, uh, what do you call it? Like video game style uh, synthesizer music, mm-hmm. which is, the, the, again, the leads on it are really good. Like, I... I big fan of like the leads we're hearing so far like sometimes i i don't know i guess maybe it's just me maybe i'm maybe i'm not alone i feel like um when you get to making like electronic music whether it's like dance or synth pop or anything you know they can be kind of corny because i think the the patch you use you know is kind of corny and therefore a whole big bowl of corn uh but these these last few have been really really good um real big fan so yeah so far so good yeah well then uh let's keep that train a training uh yeah i think that's the saying (laughs) i I say it all the time yeah it's at least my third time today (laughs) that's interesting (laughs) any hoozle (laughs) uh next up we have a song from star parody er parody 
I think that's how it's done. <laughs> Next up, we have a song from a from Star Paradier. 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 I'm just going to keep doing it. Star Paradier <laughs> is a vertical scrolling shooter that was made as a parody of Star Soldier. Are they parodying their own games? Yes. It, it was released only in Japan in 1992 because apparently Americans don't have a sense of humor. But there is a North American ROM on the internet that has all stages and music, just no sound effects. Um, I don't see a point in it. In this game, you can play as three different crafts. The Star Soldier Ship, a giant flying bomber man, or an anthropomorphic PC engine console that shoots hue cards, CD-ROMs, or homing missiles at enemies. Apparently that's Rob's favorite, so... <laughs> There's something interesting about writing uh, dialogue and text and then third-personing yourself into it so that someone else reads it. <laughs> I really appreciate this, Rob. Um, also, instead of blowing up, some enemies just wave white flags and surrender. There are a total of six stages in the game. Some of the bosses in the game include a bunch of triangles that make a boss that you battle. Uh, after a bit, they make a different boss and do this four times. Uh, a maraca fish, a giant snowman that throws his head at you, a snake charmer that has three different snakes and one will pop out that you can hit and you must take all three out before the battle ends. And a giant bomber man that has a bomber man stage where you have to shoot him without getting blown up by his bombs. The composer is Hiroshi Sayato. Rob says, <laughs> "I like these." <laughs> All right, just, just just so you know, I put that in there uh, because this. I don't. I, at a certain point, it occurred to me that maybe this wasn't written as a script. Maybe he was just giving me information, but I was already too deep into it by this point. <laughs> so that I, I changed things, like where he said in parentheses, "My personal favorite." I was like, "Rob's personal favorite," or when All he had right. a thing to say, I changed it to a quote. Uh, so so. Fantastic. Rob, I take it back. I apologize. <laughs> Thanks, and also, Chris. I apologize if I uh, if we're doing this wrong. There's no wrong. It's only wave back. Rob says, quote, picking one stage to listen to was hard, as they are all very good. But we will be listening to stage one music, end quote. And to fulfill Rob's promise of listening to stage one, here it comes. Stage one music from Star Paradeer. Enjoy.
That was uh, scene one from Star Parodier. I, I guess that's what it's called. Uh, I know I, I'm, I'm intentionally saying it wrong because it's ridiculous. I, I mean, I've I've heard about this game for ages. I've never played one, but I've always thought they were a really hilarious idea. And the fact that it's like there's a whole series of these things is just freaking wonderful. Uh, <laughs> I loved that. I loved that song. Yeah, <laughs> was, that was a really, really good song. Oh, my goodness. That is like that's. That hits all of my like video game music 101 things. It's like <laughs> wonderful soaring uh, yes. major chords. It's like this is this is some uh, some very me style video game music. I I was thrilled with it. Lo- loved it. I loved the 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 instrument choices and everything. The uh, the the big like explosive finale. The, yes. the piano is very epic, but also like you can tell that it's it can still perfectly fit in with a parody game. It, it was lovely. Right, yeah, there is a little level of kind of like, uh, eh, 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 see what we did there? Um, but everything you just said is is pretty spot on to how I feel, too. Um, it's got a very, like, triumphant, you know, feel to it mm-hmm. in a way that may not necessarily be a genuine and i don't mean that to say like the, the soundtrack's not genuine the game's not genuine but it's it's more of like uh like anything you can do i can do better kind of thing like look we didn't see huh uh-huh uh-huh say 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 um let's see i i, I dug it i liked i did like the soaring part and then of course the ending the like oh okay <laughs> you're finished got it thank you <laughs> and i'm spent yeah all right gonna take a nap now so i was i was good that was really good yeah, I was a uh, very, very much enjoyed that one. Uh, good pick. Okay, let's see what is next here. Our next song comes to us from a game called Cotton Fantastic Night Dreams, which is another uh, CD game. Cotton is a horizontal scrolling shooter that was released in 1991 for multiple platforms. And this is the first game in the Cotton series where you are a young witch, a young witch named Cotton who has a fairy companion, Silk, that sits on your broomstick, which I can only assume is named uh, after some other fabric. Let's say, uh, let's see, we got cotton, we got silk. Corduroy. Oh, corduroy. Yeah, your broomstick, corduroy. And your best friend, um, uh, polyester. (laughs) (laughs) As you travel through the increasingly difficult uh, difficult levels in a fantasy dreamlike world in a quest to defeat monsters and get her willow candy. See, now I'm genuinely disappointed that that candy is not named after a fabric. Rayon. Rayon candy. That's what I'm renaming it. Uh, There are seven stages in the game. (laughs) Rayon candy. (laughs) (laughs) It's terrible and flammable and it's going to kill you. (laughs) There are seven stages in the game and you can level up your weapon to level 13. The player has three lives, which are represented by brooms, although only one hit is allowed per life. Once you get hit three times, three lives, the game is over. Loose price of cotton is currently sitting around $132. A that is that is way too expensive for the fabric of our lives. Thank you. <laughs> oh, man. That joke was better than mine. <laughs> the, composer <laughs> is, the composer is Kenichi Hirata, and we will be listening to, once again, the Stage 1 music. Uh, and, yeah, I'm into it. Let's, let's, I've never played a cotton game before. Um, I've heard of them. I think there was a new one just released on Switch and other modern consoles like this year, but I don't know. Let's let's listen to some some witchy co- cotton music. Here is stage one. Enjoy.
What's with these uh, these songs all having actual endings? Like that's pretty wild. Uh, this is driving me bananas. There is uh, there is a song that Banjo Guy Ali covers that res this reminds me of it so much, and I keep mm -hmm. looking for it. Like, is this the same song? But I'm not seeing anything cotton related on his website at all. Uh, I, I I don't know what I don't know what to do about this information. It's driving me crazy. But anyway, <laughs> this is a this is a super cool song. Uh, this is a again with the very uh, you know high quality synth music is a uh, quite quite wonderful. But it's a uh, more more driving music, more very uh, very energetic. Not what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. I kind of was expecting something a little bit more uh, traditionally spooky. You know, uh, okay. with the, the the whole witch theme and the brooms. Yeah. I was expecting us to be like. All right, something kind of ghosts and goblins related, you know, or just something mm. that has those those Halloweenish threads in it. But this had none of that. This was just shooter, hundred percent through and through, which I think is pretty neat. I, I liked it. Yeah, big fan. Like super high, super high energy. Um, the horn section was very interesting. Yeah, that was that was quite. I, that was another piece of it that I really did not see coming. Was the 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 horn section. I felt very like it was very unexpected, but like a in in a wonderful way. Um, nice, nice surprise there. I like some. I like that you know to have that you know get caught off guard and and but you know and, and be pleasantly surprised and think, oh, okay, oh that's cool, that's cool. So yeah, definitely, uh, definitely a fan of this. Cool. Uh, I guess that makes it my turn. Next, we have a song from Raisin Bar. Raisin Bar. <laughs> Raisin Two. Bar. Raisin Bar. It's the most boring salad bar ever. The California Raisin Bar. <laughs> Raisin Bar. <laughs> I can't. All right. Next, we have a song from Raisin Bar. I almost said the second. Because <laughs> it's got... <laughs> Two. It's his formal name. <laughs> it's colloquially known as Raisin Bar the second. No. All right. Anyway, Raisin Bar 2. It's a CD game. Raisin Bar is a horizontal shoot 'em up uh, that many compare to R Type. The game received mixed reviews when it came out because of its very high difficulty. It is the follow up to Raisin Bar from the FM Towns. As usual, for shoot 'em ups at the time, you were in control of a ship trying to stop an alien invasion. You can get three color coded weapons for your ship, and as you collect that color, the weapon will get more powerful. Also, if you hold the fire button down when you release, it will shoot a more powerful shot than if you con it will shoot a more powerful shot than if you constantly shoot. If you get hit and die, you lose that weapon, no matter how powerful it was. Its current loose price is $144, and Rob says, quote, I choose stage one, as you will be hearing the music a lot, as this game is very difficult. The composer of this game, uh, I guess that's end quote, the composer of this game is Yashihito Sayuto. Geosynchronous Orbit is the name of the track we're about to listen to. It's stage one. It's from Ryzen Bar 2. Enjoy. <laughs>
Okay. What'd you make of that one? Well, like a hat or a boat. Or <laughs> a... I, I like that a lot. I actually really like the orchestra hits in it. They yeah. weren't uh, terribly cheesy like you would find kind of at that time. Um, they they fit in really, really well. It's a good a good piece of music put together from like top to bottom. Yeah, uh, so <clears throat> I, I agree with your sentiments. That was a very, uh, a very... I like the orchestra hits as well. They 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 also stuck out uh, stuck out at me. It was very, again, another very clear. This is stage one. This is high energy. Uh, I don't know what else to say about it. <laughs> I just I just I I uh, also was a a toe tapping good time. Yeah, yeah, no, can't argue with you. All right, so uh, I think uh, that's enough farting around. Uh, let's move on to our yeah. <laughs> let's let's do the thing we came here to do. Yeah. So our next song hails from Ginga Fuke Densetsu Sapphire, which is an arcade CD game. Ginga Fuke Densetsu Sapphire, more commonly known as Sapphire, Jack can't imagine why, is a shoot 'em up <laughs> for the PC engine that used the arcade card. The game is primarily a vertical shooter, but also occasionally moves you horizontally, which was not common for the time. The story for Sapphire is a very unique one. You are an all-woman police force in the year 2092 that travels through time to intercept terrorists committing crimes in the past and in the future. Uh, you can choose, as you do, you can yeah. choose one of four characters that each has their own weapons. Each character is well-balanced. If you have very powerful weapons, then your ship will move slower, and if your weapons are not as powerful, you can move faster. This game is loved by some and hated by some. Hmm. At only five stages, and the game is pretty short, though there were plans for a sixth stage, and you can hear the music for it on the internet. However, it was never put into the game. For this reason, some consider the game unfinished. This game is also one of the most expensive games for the PC Engine. As of this writing, this game goes for $762 loose. Wow. Combine that with needing the arcade card, which goes for $63 for the duo version, and you are looking at over $825 before tax and shipping just to play the game. If you don't have a duo system, you'll need the Arcade Card Pro, which is going for another $170 on top of that. Rob says, Choosing one song from this stunning soundtrack was very difficult, as the entire soundtrack is great. The entire soundtrack is filled with hard-rocking music and high-powered synths. I chose level 2, as it has a hard rock with a fast portion in it, and a slow portion right in the middle. To me, the music is exactly what you are looking for in a shoot 'em up The composer is is Tease Music, which also did Lords of Thunder for Sega CD. Interesting. I didn't know Lords of Thunder was on Sega CD. Huh. Well, uh, I'm excited. Um, it, this certainly sounds like a unique set of music, so let's give it a, let's give it a listen. Here is Stage 2 Medieval Times from <laughs> Sapphire. Yeah, we're just going to call it Sapphire. Enjoy.
I know this is credited to T's music, but I can't shake the feeling that this song was performed and written by Wild Stallions. Ha! <laughs> Wild Stallions rules. And so does San Dimas High School football. Absolutely. Uh, I, well, I mean, that was awesome. <laughs> this is very, uh, very... I don't know what the word I'm looking for is when I say butt rock, but in a great way. Uh... Very rockin' tune. I, I very, very, very much enjoyed it. It was bopping my head along the entire time uh, I was listen, listening. Uh, it's a... Uh, sounds good. Yeah, I'm I'm very curious to... to I, I want to I watch some videos of this game in action. I'm not going to drop $825 to play it, but uh, no. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Yes. Um... The, the whole premise of the game has got me interested, and then if this is indicative of the soundtrack, then I'm, I'm definitely very, very curious. Um, it was... I'll agree with you with the, the butt rock where it gets the butt shaken. Oh, yeah. Um, I did not expect that, <laughs> period. It, it kind of tore open, and I was like, oh, hi, okay, great. <laughs> this, is, this is what we're doing, all right. Um, cool, cool, cool. But, uh, you know, all jokes aside, it's a pretty good track. Like, pretty well put together, you know. Um, a, lot of, a lot of shredding. A lot of, like, <laughs> you know, uh, noodly, shreddy, soaring, solo guitar work. I concur. <laughs> all right. Let's, uh, let, let's keep going. What, what do we got next, Matt, for our, our last in, for our last in-episode song? I believe the word you're looking for is pen ultimate. <laughs> Sorry. Our penultimate track hails from Gate of Thunder. It was a CD game. Gate of Thunder is a horizontal shoot 'em up and was the first game in North America to be produced for the Super CD ROM 2 nice format. Game. Yeah, I had to. And was a pack in game for the Turbo Duo. You controlled the hunting dog fighter craft piloted by Space Cop Hawk. Man, the 90s were wild. Uh, you also have a support ship piloted by Etsy, Esti, excuse me, not to be confused with the crafting website Etsy, who drops off power-ups to you every so often. Maybe it is Etsy crafting power-ups for you. Anyway, uh, the enemy is trying to obtain an energy source from planet Ares called Starlight, and you must stop them. There are three types of weapons in the game that you can uh, get by collecting different color orbs, which Etsy drops off. Esti which SD drops off every so often. Uh, you can change between the weapons at any time by hitting a button. When you die, whatever weapon you had is gone, but the rest are at uh, the power they were before you died. The three weapons are a laser, which is blue, waves, which is green, and earthquake, which is red. Earthquake looks like missiles. I I don't write them, I just read them. <laughs> Once you collect one weapon, you get two satellites that shoot along with you. When you die, you respawn right where you died. So no going back to annoying checkpoints. Rob says, The song I chose is the prologue, stage one music. Has some nice guitars in it, and the drums keep it moving. End quote. Uh, and with that said, uh, we're going to listen to prologue, stage one music from Gate of Thunder. Enjoy.
Okay. Look, I have never played Gate of Thunder, but I have played Lords of Thunder, and uh, that soundtrack certainly lives up to Lords of Thunder's uh, energy and awesome level. Uh, it was very... <laughs> I liked that one a lot. I liked the, uh, the, the, the bending of the strings, the... Uh, the, the, the you know the guitar sounds themselves like it, pretty much just everything about that was was fantastic it certainly was like another you know like time capsule track oh um, for sure for sure but it's really good it's a uh, it's fun like it's i wouldn't listen to that style of like um rock or metal except for like in a video game where i, I personally think like all right you know that's it's acceptable i i enjoy this <laughs> Um, yeah, in in the right con like this isn't this a song that I'm listening to on its own for funsies, but uh, in the context of this game, abs right. flog and lootly. Oh, oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what else to really say about it. Yeah, it was uh, um, yeah, you know, product of its time, very uh, very enjoyable uh, enjoyable music. I have nothing of value to add. <laughs> No, not really. I don't know. <laughs> I feel kind of bad, but I mean, you know. It, right, I could uh, just keep, I mean, I could keep talking saying that I love it over and over again, but as, as far as something of actual value to add to it, I'm sorry I've, I've uh, in that in that respect. It's, uh, it's, just, it's just a good time. Yes. So, uh, I guess that, that, that's pretty much it. That, uh, that's where we're going to end things today. We do, of course, you know, a, a song to play you out, which is from uh, Lords of Thunder, the one that I am familiar with. But uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, overall, I rather enjoyed this. This was a this was a really good time with some music that was all new to me from games that I have never played before. But I would like to uh, fire up my um, SD. Uh, um, that's the wrong word. Uh, Super SD System Three. And see if I have any of these on my uh, on my Turbo Graphics right now that I can try to play. Uh, just who knows? Maybe I do. But uh, either way, uh, this is some pretty cool stuff. So thank you, Rob, for your well thought out and uh, wonderful list of music for us to listen to today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, big fan of the stuff I heard. Uh, I'd be curious to honestly play some. I'm not the biggest, um, you know, like shoot 'em up kind of guy, but you know, I throw it down a little bit. So. Yeah. Awesome. Well, then, uh, that's going to be our show. Join us next time when we will be having another request episode. This time is a patron request. Uh, Duroc Pig has requested that we cover the Dreamcast classic Jet Grind Radio. And gosh darn it, we're going to do it in a timely fashion. Yes. I haven't played Jet Grind Radio in ages, but I, have I loved that game when it came out. Uh, it was it was great. Um, but, yeah, I haven't listened, to the, haven't listened to the soundtrack in forever, so I, I couldn't point it out. I couldn't. I couldn't pick out anything for you, but he didn't give us a whole like breakdown of like which songs to listen to. It's just I want to hear a Jack Ryan radio episode, and well, we're gonna do it. So, <laughs> so now go do it. That that'll happen next month. Uh, anyways, we here at the Waveback Podcast are incredibly grateful to everyone who listens, and we love communicating with you when we can. We have a couple of ways you can do that. There's the Geek Aid Discord channel in which we have a Waveback chat where we frequently discuss all manner of stuff relating to video game music and whatever our next episodes are going to be. Uh, and, of course, you can still send us an email at mail at geekade.com. And while you're at it, check out all our other social media channels, which you should totally follow, like, and subscribe to if you haven't already. Waveback, oh, excuse me, Waveback and other Geekade podcasts are made possible thanks to the Geekade Patreon page. Their, pa their patrons can get uh, access to a monthly podcast topic and recording schedule, get early access to most of Geekade's shows, including this one and more. And if you've enjoyed our podcast over the years, please follow the link in the description and give it a look. We really appreciate it. Finally, as always, be sure to check out all the other great content we have on our site over at geekade.com. Matt, do you have anything to plug before we uh, say goodbye? I do not. Okay. Uh, me neither. Nothing in specific. Geekade's great. Go listen to stuff. Yeah. We're going to leave you tonight with Rob's final pick, a song from the ever-wonderful Lords of Thunder. Uh, Lords of Thunder is an unofficial follow-up to Gate of Thunder. This game is both a horizontal and vertical scrolling shoot 'em up in this game, you control a knight and get to choose which armor you want to wear prior to each level. You can tackle the six levels in whatever order you want. Once you select which stage you would like to play, you choose which of the four available armors you want to wear. After that, you can choose power-ups, increased life bar, shields, and health-restoring elixirs that cost money in the form of crystals that you obtain while playing each level. 
This game is very difficult because once you die, it's game over. There are limited continues, though you can use some of your crystals to buy another one if you want to. There are occasional hearts to restore your health, but these are not given away very often. Rob says, The whole soundtrack is full of hard rock music and fits the game perfectly. The game was ported to the Sega CD with mixed reviews. The TurboGrafx-16 version is definitely the one to play. For the music from this game, I chose Desant. This is the desert level, and the music keeps you going and is rocking the entire time. The guitar is really good in this song, and the drums are simple but perfect. Well said, Rob. Uh, I'm looking forward to listening to it, and uh, as much as I'm sure all of you are as well. Thanks for joining us, everybody, and we'll see you next time, uh, and have a happy and safe Thanksgiving.